things that I desire and pray that after this we will be able to take home, that we will be able to identify the place of family, and I talk about Christian family. In our society, in our areas of influence, that we will be able to articulate, articulate the God-given mandate for Christian family. That we will appreciate that God has a purpose for family. And that purpose we have to deliberately work towards making that purpose to be fulfilled. Of course, by the grace of God. And finally, to help redirect our families. So where we have gone astray, that we will be able to redirect, redirect our families to God. And so there are several areas of darkness. I am not even able to talk about all of them. Today, I'll summarize them. And trust me, I was good in summary. I'm an accountant by profession, so when we do justification, we do three lines. Why? <laughs> Peter is laughing. <laughs> Why do you need it? Is it necessary? Must you incur this cost? So when you see an accountant, they ask you why, why, why. Please forgive them. They are trained to ask why. And I'm one of them. And sometimes my wife always says, you ask a lot of questions. I do ask. Uh, and I sometimes also ask myself those questions. <laughs> so one of the areas that is a bit, bit, bit controversial is same sex marriage agenda. A few years ago, we thought this thing will not come to Africa. I'm so blessed when our president one day was asked by a superpower president, and he said it is a non-issue to us in Kenya. So let's not even discuss about it. Yet this discussion is in a church. It's in our society. Uh, for 15 Okay, 12, 12, 13 years, I worked in the NGO world. To be specific, in research, clinical research. And uh, the projects that you can really get away with proposals without a lot, back and, a lot of back and forth are the project that touches on LGBT. Anything touching on lesbianism, gayism, of course, we bring it in a nice way, advocacy. Those ones, when you submit those proposals, for us, for me as an accountant, I always see they are happy. Another area that we will highlight is divorce, separation, remarriage. Uh, this one is a good area. Of course, media, when I was preparing for this, I didn't know we are starting with media. And so media came first. And so I'm not going to talk about media, but media is another area. The other one is devotion, devotion, reading of God's word in our families, parenting. That's another area that darkness has come. And so I begin with same sex marriage. I'll give a bit of uh, statistics. Lesbians and gay couples are increasingly being allowed in church. Not outside there, in church. As of July 2020, same-sex marriage is legal. There's a difference allowed, supported, encouraged, but there's a difference when they say it is legal. And let me just take European countries, and I'll give you a bit of that in Africa. 16 European countries. I don't want to read the names. 
14 others recognize same-sex marriage in European. LGBT, LGBT anti-discrimination anti laws also exist in Africa. Seven African countries. Let me read it for you so that even as you pray, you pray for our brothers and sisters. One of them is Angola, Botswana, Cape Verde, Mauritius, Mozambique, Seychelles, and South Africa. I think South Africa has been the real one. They have entrenched it in their law. Some of us were of age when we were having our referendum as a nation, Kenya, 2010. It cost a lot of money for you to run a referendum as a nation. I'll give you a country that went for referendum in 2015, Ireland, it's called Ireland, went for a, re a referendum in 2015, to be specific, 22nd May, same-sex marriage. And they approved the proposal to add the words, and I'll read those words, Marriage may be contracted in accordance with the law by two persons without distinction as to their sex. A whole nation, referendum, funded, all people vote, approved, entrenched in a constitution. What they were entrenching is marriage may be contracted in accordance with the law by two persons without distinction as to their sex. The question that begs, what kind of darkness is this? When God created us to procreate, God created us to fill the earth, how will Otieno and Otieno fill the earth? What kind of deception do we have? Yet, what we call this discrimination, anti-discrimination, is for us not to talk about it. So if today I was in South Africa and talking about what I'm talking today, after this, I will go to jail because I'm discriminating. A question, as I was preparing, I asked myself, we believe in God. Some of us believe, some people who are watching to me, watching me through the Facebook, the world, whoever will watch this, we believe in something. So for example, if we believe that this same-sex marriage is for real, ordained by a God, small g, so when we talk that another person who believe that God created man, and woman, male and female, he created them. Are we not discriminating against the other people who believe on the other thing? Yet today, if you apply for a proposal, you do a proposal to do advocacy, uh, and you, you are, your target will be church, that you want to do a project, you want to speak to preachers, you want to speak to church leaders, to a accept same-sex marriage, to embrace them, you will get funds. So from the word goal, we are very clear that we embrace the lesbians and guys, gays. We allow them even to come to church. But we will tell them the truth, that the Bible in Leviticus 18.22 says that's abomination. So we will walk with them, we will counsel them, but we will continue to tell them the truth, that marriage is key, and it's only for male and female. So don't get my message wrong, that I'm against the people. I'm not against God's people. We are against the sin. We hate the sin, and we will help people to deal with the sin. 
and you who is listening to me, we have to talk with boldness. That this element is sin. God loves you the way you are. But this element is sin. There's a serious political agenda uh, with LGBT. Uh, a few conferences I've seen. My wife attended one in South Africa. So recent. That's last year. Mm, no, not last year. The other year, 2019. And I think it's 2019 that South Africa passed that law. And a man, of course, these are serious doctors, professors, said, now I'm happy I can kiss my loved one in public. Of course, in Africa, if a man goes kissing a man in public, as much as we say we can embrace, but you always frown. If, if, I was to <laughs> if I was to show some videos here, some of you will walk out. Because in African culture, we have not accepted some of these things. As much as maybe those elements are there, but naturally we have not accepted them. And so you can imagine how this person was, a serious international conference, and say, now we have the freedom. I can kiss my loved one. So this, it appeals to the top cream of the society. You'll be surprised. You'll be so surprised that the top cream society, of course, it comes in very many ways, legal rights, discrimination. In our workplaces, we need to be careful on our comments. And if you are from the background and NGO like me, where you have expatriates, we don't need to say some things. We don't. We need to be accommodative to many. And so the question to you and me is, at that moment when you are becoming accommodative, where is the truth? I don't like ugali so much. So sometimes if you ask me, what would you want to eat? I'll say, maybe rice will come there. But uh, if you give me the opportunity to tell me, to, to tell you what I really don't like, I'll tell you, I don't like ugali. How comes you don't have issues when I tell you I don't like ugali? But you love issue when I tell you I don't subscribe to the same-sex marriage. How comes? Because we have made it a political agenda. And somewhere to the east, to the west, someone is orchestrating a dance. Is training his people on this dance. And we don't need to question this dance. We only need to accept the dance. Because if we question, then there are repercussions. I applied for a job in 2013. That job was to take me to South Sudan. And it was a referral. And I was told I qualify for it. The only thing I need to do is to show my interest so that they could pick me. There are interviews that you, you don't go for interviews. Already the interview is done. It's for you to show interest. So one of these jobs, well-paying. Of course, when you are, you always desire for an increase. Uh, by then, I think I was having five figures. So I always decided to have six figures because I used to hear about six figures. And a job came. 
And now you see this job is taking me to out of the country. The only country I'd gone was TZ, Rwanda, Burundi. But now I'm going to work as an expatriate. And they send you those details, the benefits, the insurance, the flights, every quarter. Uh, and when I, you know, when a job comes, you look at the description, you look at the organization, you look at who is funding this project. Then I realized it had elements of LGBT. Uh, sometimes I don't know how to say no in a nice way. Sometimes I've grown. Kitambo was a bit crude. I could just tell you, Apana. Uh, I could say it in a nice way, uh, rudely, that you don't know my stand. So I've grown. So I had to say no in a nice way. Until I was cornered, I said, I can't pick this job. Yes. And you see, sometimes we share. In our professional work, we share. We say, oh, I would really love to work out of Kenya. I would really love to grow in my career. So this person who was forwarding this job knew my desire. He knew my prayers. And the opportunity had come. And God was working through, through him. Of course, it is a moment that he expected me to be very happy and bless the Lord and call for a celebration. Only for me to do that mail that I'm not picking this. The question came, why? You know, when you ask so many whys, other people also start asking you why. So if you don't want us to ask, you don't ask. But again, if you don't want to grow, don't ask. So because we desire to grow in the Lord, we have to ask. You have to ask Pastor Njeri, why? So we can't survive without asking, why? So I was asked, why are you not picking this opening? In fact, we are not going to do <laughs> the interviews. So why are you not picking it? And you see that moment, you don't want to make someone feel bad that they have worked, they have really talked to who is who, and then for only George to say no. So I said, I just have my family reason, personal reasons. Have you ever been told about personal reasons? Personal reasons. Uh, I always have a nice one. Uh, let me consult with my family. Sometimes I know the answer is no, but even I'm not going to consult with Sophie, but I've just said, I've thrown a big word. Let me consult with my family. So that by the time you ask me, uh, we sat and we had a meeting and uh, we decided that this is not the right time. Yet in my mind, I know, Ore, this is no. So I tried to pull that, that for personal reason, I'm not going to pick this job. My friend was so straight. I can be a judge. You're the one who tells us to be straight, honest, and open. What is this personal reason? Is it your family? Is it, what is it? Then I said, my friend, I checked out this job. And I checked the funders. And I thoroughly believe that God has a reason for family. I cannot advocate for same-sex marriage. And then he told me, you are not the one going out there in the field. It's people. You are doing accounts. You are doing figures. Of course, it's the same thing that you'll say, working for, for EBL is okay because you are not the one drinking. It's other people's children and other people's husbands, other people's wives who are drinking, other people's uncles and aunties. It is not, not it's, see your way, way, but the others. So it's good for others, but it is bad for me. Uh, to me, I can just come to church, raise my hands, pay my tithe, uh, because it is not good for me as a Christian, but I can pass it on to the next Christian 
to fall. And so it was a hard but a nice decision to make and to explain. And my friendship ended there with that friend of mine. Because I was told, as the Bible says, you are one of the foolish people the Bible has referred to. <laughs> you are one of them. You don't say you are a checker, but when you are told you are a fool. <laughs> if Pastor Munene, Reverend Munene come here and tell you, you are a fool, you are a fool. You love issue with him. But going home, I was happy. I took it up. So as we seek to radiate, and this discussion is not ending today. Same-sex marriage is not ending today. And it is a real one. Eh, because we have pastors. At least South Africa. At least in America, you hear them. Not only wedding others, but they are also ready to wed in holy matrimony. I have statistics, and I was surprised to see the number of priests who are gay and are serving. And so to me and you, what are we going to do about it? When these discussions come up in the Facebook, in our social circles, in our workplace, what is your stand? Would you deny Christ so that you can make men happy? Would you have that nice pay, the nice park, so that you can make the world happy? Or would you rather show them to the cross? The answer belongs within you. The answer belongs within you. And so I come to the next where we experience darkness is in parenting and I'll combine it with devotion. Today we have gadgets, phones, and there are a number of plans. If you are in new version, uh, there are a number of plans. Bible reading plans. Some of them are one week. Some of them 40, 14 days. Some of them 21 days. And you said your family is a Christian family. So today I'm speaking to you if your family is a Christian family. So what makes it a Christian family? If devotion is not at the central of it. In Psalms 119 verse 1, it says, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Our family altar. Of course, family altar is a very big word. Some people think it is a, a table set only for prayers. Today, let me make it simple and clear. That family altar is the time we give to God to pray as a family. Some of our prayers we have perfected only praying at the time when we go to eat. And someone told me, we should pray more. Even we should have a set time. But I've been convinced that if that time of eating is where all are able to gather, we can still work with that time and make it our family altar. That before we pray for the food, we ask ourselves, how was your day? What are the challenges? What are the wins for you today? How can we pray with you? And then we read the scripture. We give each and everyone an opportunity. Our children, the young ones, 
and even the ones that are of age. We give them an opportunity to read the scripture and just say what the scripture is speaking to them in their lives. Because if we don't do this, if we don't do this, then the altar runs dry. There's no oil running or burning on it. I don't know why we, we, we don't want to make use of this time. You only have your children for 18 years. When we get to 18, or when we approach 18, because I was there, we always love our independence. We want to move out. If you have trained as well, we want to move out. So for less than 18, war unto you, I think on SMLD on Saturday we were being told, if you take your kid for boarding in primary, another time lost that you don't have an influence in their lives. Someone else in, is influencing them. And so this devotion is a critical part of our lives. But it's the most lightly approached subject in our families. It's reverent purity. Last Sunday talked about even meals. People call for meals through WhatsApp. And so you say, dinner is ready, come. The little we learn, we don't want to use them or we spare it for a day. We don't want to teach our children. We don't want to give them opportunity to ask us the serious questions. And where could they ask these questions safe if it's not in our homes at this time of family altar. And so this feeds into our parenting. We are blessed. We are able to have three house managers. So one of them deals with kitchen. Another one is for laundry and matters that, and another one is for our children. When they cry, when they just say, I need this, I need a fork, there's someone to respond. So if we were to ask you about your teens, about your children, and I had the opportunity to speak in the fortress. And some of the things, parents, if I share with you, you'll say, that's not my daughter. That's not my son. Because with us, we speak with them in fun. It's a, a round table. Everyone is equal. And they're able to talk. Some of you, the way you parent is like someone I know. Now that this is on Facebook, it might be used against me in my family. But we had parents that they look only told you whether you scatter or you gather. They look. Some of us, we saw, not my family. I'm talking about your family. That when the dad whistles, and he always whistled so that he would announce his presence. <whistles> or he kicks the gate. Everyone gets busy. You got to do some things. So there's no room for talking. There's no room for trying to express yourself. And that's how we we parent darkness. So when you send your kids to the Sunday school, to the fortress, to the crossroad, you expect Pastor Ponga to shape them. And back at home, that responsibility you have given to your home manager. They're the ones who know when the 
homework is due. They are the ones who know the... And you tell them, please remind me the next parents' meeting. I heard Reverend Jerry talking about, remind me so that I don't forget. So who keeps the diary? It's the home manager. And we have seen these things happen. Kids get to high school, uh, they know dad and mom are not in the same wavelength. So a geography trip, the same dad and mom, same family pays for the same trip. So the, the guy comes to the mom, 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 we have, a, we have a trip. And they know how to manipulate us because they know we are not together. Mom, if you don't give me, I'll tell dad. Of course, if you're from some of the families I know, only that statement in many years would land you in a big problem. We have got ourselves into unhealthy competition that we are passing to our children. And so our children come and say, Uncle so and so has this big car. Dad, when are you buying your next big car? Dad, our house only has a few rooms. I want a room for myself. And no one should get into this room. If the reason is asked, it's because... Uncle so and so, auntie so and so have the same and my friend is given full access and their parents don't get into those rooms. So that's what you should do to me also, dad. And as parents, we allow this darkness to get into our families. And we have rooms that we don't ac have access to. Under our roof, of course, my dad will ask, in this house, it is me and your mom that own it. So how do you say you, my room? But leave alone my dad, because it's from that old age, they didn't know how to parent. They were not good parents. They were not. They didn't give room for negotiations. They were not. They didn't develop us to be people who are self-reliant. They didn't develop us to have self-esteem. They always shouted at us. That's my dad. And so today we are struggling with self-esteem. So today for us to build a people, anything they ask, give them. If they want a car, and I've seen this, and let me say it with boldness. Even children that don't have driving licenses are given cars. Here, Sita Mombasa. Let's, not, let's forget about others. Here. What does the law say about driving? You must be licensed to drive. And parents are happy to do it. Uh, please don't stone me after this. Some of these stories, it's your kids that share when we talk with them. And so other children come and say, Dad, George is driving. What about me? Of course, that competition in our lives, we want also to be where other people are. So we start allowing our children to drive. And that's how we parent. And that's how we allow darkness into our rooms, in our homes. Because we have rooms, we have competition. I think we need to be fair if we are to compete with the next family. Call the family to your place, say, we want to compete with you. So that it is a fair game. We want to compete with you. So you have a big car, let us be equal. Same level, so we know... So that you don't go ahead of us. That's a fair competition. But when you start competing without even talking to these people. 
really, some of them worked hard. You only see it today. Some of them, their grandparents worked hard because the scripture says a good parent leaves inheritance to the children of his and then you want to compete. So you need to call them for a meeting and then it becomes a fair competition. Before I talk about my last area of darkness, I'll call my two friends, Mr. and Mrs. Mwangi, to help me read some two scriptures. This area is a heavy one, so their presence will help me. And uh, they know the scripture they are supposed to read. So before they read, I'll read for you. Because the scripture is what speaks to us. But there are people who shape our minds. We call them opinion shapers. And I just compiled a few of what they say about marriage. A very great topic indeed. After marriage, this is the quote. After marriage, husband and wife become two sides of a coin. They can't just face each other. But still, they stay together. That was Al Gore. Al Gore was a former U.S. vice president. He ran for presidency. That's what he said about marriage. Different side of a coin. They can't just face each other. But they are still together. <laughs> this one is... Uh, a nice one. By all means, marry. If you get a good wife, you'll be happy. If you get a bad one, you'll become a philosopher. <laughs> Only you, you, you look for Peter to tell you more about that. He's the one who meets married people. That was from a philosopher, Socrates. Wife inspires us to great things and prevent us from achieving them. <laughs> it's not me, Mike Tyson, a boxer, was a great person. Talking about marriage. I had some words with my wife. And you can guess, she had some. You can guess, I had some words with my wife. And she had some paragraphs with me. That was Bill Clinton. There's a way of transferring funds that is even faster than electronic banking. That it is faster than M-Pesa. It's called marriage. That was Michael Jordan. A good wife always forgives her husband when she's wrong. That's Barack Obama. <laughs> when she's wrong. If you have ever been told, you never apologize. When you are in love, wonders happen. When you are in love, wonders happen. But once you get married, you wonder what happened. Steve Jobs. Marriage is beautiful forest where brave lions are killed by beautiful deers. Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt is a... I've, I've watched several movies. He's an actor, he's a producer, and he's talking about marriage. Marriage is the only battle in the world where the combats share a bed. You, we know of war now, Ukraine, Russia, but marriage is the only battle in the world where the combats share a bed. Andrew Kuto. And so, the question it begs, do you identify with those things or you disagree with them? Do they shape your marriage or you are the one who shapes your marriage through the grace of God? Please. Uh, 
Okay, give them time as they, he picks his Bible. Matthew chapter 18, they'll read for us a portion of fixture. We wanted to read all of it, but time is gone. So we'll read from a bit, just for us to give us a background, even as we bring this to a conclusion. Joseph, you can read. Praise the Lord, church. I'm reading from Matthew 18, from verse 21 to 35. I read from uh, New King James Version. Um, it says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heavens is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts. Sorry wanted to settle accounts one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 10,000 talents but as he was not able to pay his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made the servant therefore fell down before him saying master have patience have patience with me and i will pay you all Verse 27, then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I'll pay you all. And he would not but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what, he had, um, what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Verse 35. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. I'm going to read from Matthew 19 from verse 1 to 11. And the word of the Lord says, now it came to pass when Jesus had finished, had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to a region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, it is, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he made them at the beginning, made them male and female, verse 5, and said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? Verse 8. He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples say to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Verse 11. But he said to them, all cannot accept this saying, but only this to whom it has been given. 
Amen. Thank you so much. Clap for them, please. So that's God's word. Divorce, another area of serious darkness. Uh, I won't repeat what the word says because that's the blueprint. But I'll only highlight that if you are in a toxic relationship, church doesn't say stay there and wait to die so that we come and bury you. No. If you are in a toxic union, please seek for help. And church will be glad to help. So there's always room for separation with a mind of reconciliation. So the key word is reconciliation. We have read Matthew 18. Please take time, especially for the married ones. And I'm speaking to the ones who are seeking to get to that institution of marriage. It's Jesus talking about it. It's Paul talking about it. It's God talking about it. All this time, divorce is not our issue. Marriage is not our issue. It's God's agenda. And so, let's give room for us to work on our relationship, for God to shine his glory in our marriages, in our relationships. The word says, God hates divorce. And I guess we don't want to love what God hates. I guess. If your guess is right as mine, we know it's not the right place for us to be. What God hates. And so, let's give direction. Sometimes people come to us and we are the ones who are quick to let them divorce. Divorce is so light in our mouths. If this man is doing this to you, you what are you still doing there? Divorce. We never seek to direct people to God's word. But if it happens, because sometimes it happens, the scripture has given us the prescription. Till the other one dies. Again, it puts you in a very tough place. If you really want to marry today and you really love the Lord, then you have to pray for someone to die so that you marry. Which one is easy? Obeying God or disobeying God by having prayers that will never be answered. So if really, 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 you love the Lord and you are so, so, so much sold, talk to God. And if God gives you the green light, my brother, my sister, you are allowed. If God gives you the green light and you will share with us and he's a good Lord, he will show us the signs like he did to Gideon when Gideon asked. So in short, it's a, it's a, it's a very hard route. But let me just speak to us from my heart. Divorce doesn't only affect you. It doesn't affect you only. It affects us as church. Do I, let me give you an example. And this has happened to me. Ule mshirika wenu, I'm a divorce. Now we own you, you have divorced. It's my problem. Why do they come to your church and they divorce? That's one thing. Your children, their heart, your family, the siblings. If it's so hard, please come and seek for help in church. I would speak in that for several times. But the blueprint, even as I come to the conclusion. But he did not make them one having a remnant of the spirit. And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 15. And let no one deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. Either of you, whatever dealing you want to deal, remember God's word, which is our blueprint. 
For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Do not deal treacherously. In conclusion, where does this leave us with this darkness, with all these issues? God is seeking a godly offspring. Where can God find it? Where can God find them? Are we going to be the home? Are we going to create the environment where God can harvest people who will call on his name? Will it be your home? Will it be there where generations to generations but on a past where people seek the Lord earnestly? Are you creating that environment? Are you that person who is deliberately creating that environment? I believe strongly that God is able to give us a restart button, reboot. He's able to deal with the bugs like in the computer, the viruses for his glory. Are we ready? Are we ready to welcome God into our families, into our lives? Are we ready to say, Lord, I've gone astray. I've dealt treacherously with my wife. I've dealt I've not committed myself to bring my children to you in word and in deed. Are you that person who is ready today to recommit your life? That, that restart button could start with you, Reverend, as you come. Do you commit yourself to saturate your life and relationship with God's word, even as we radiate God's glory? Thank you.